Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this session on the Global Education Coalition Action, the Global Learning House. My name is Boran Chakroun. I'm Director for Policies and Lifelong Learning System Division at UNESCO Headquarters, and uh, I'm pleased to moderate uh, the session. For the session, we have uh, several key speakers that uh, are joining us who will be presenting their initiatives, but also engage in discussion on how we can work collaboratively to leave no one behind. In the session, uh, I'll be making some introduction related to the uh, Global Education Coalition, its objectives, what it is trying to do. Then uh, my colleague, uh, Valtansir Mendes, will be presenting the concept and the vision that we, we have developed for the Global Learning House initiative, which is a mission-oriented approach that uh, we will be discussing during the session. Then uh, we will have an interactive panel discussion. We will hear from uh, uh, colleagues, from uh, Mr. Saeed Yassin, Director of uh, Educated Child Technical Department at uh, Education Above All. We'll hear from uh, Ms. Lauren uh, Lichman, Partnership Lead at Learning Equality. We'll hear from Mr. Louis Kofsky, Sesame Workshop, Vice President and General Manager, Latin American Executive Producer International. We'll also have the pleasure to have with us Mr. Alp Coxel from Khan Academy, Director for uh, Turkey. We have also uh, Mr. Leonardo Ortiz Villacorta, Vice President of International Partnership at Code dot org and uh, last but not least we have with, our, with us with Ms. Uh, Anna Molero Chief Government Officer Teach for All. Hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A session uh, please don't hesitate to put your uh, question also share with us uh, your uh, perception your ideas resources in the Q&A and uh, my colleagues uh, are looking at, uh, at the Q&A will be able to uh, leverage the question that uh, you'll be putting and hopefully you will engage with them. Then uh, I will uh, end with the conclusion and, and suggesting some next steps for this initiative that uh, we would like to launch as part of the Global Education Coalition. Without a delay, let me uh, just uh, uh, remind a bit uh, what is this uh, Global Education Coalition, why we launched the coalition and, and how it is functioning. Basically, um, in uh, March 2020, when uh, we were at the, the highest and the peak of uh, uh, the, the closure of education system, we reached around 1.6 billion learners who were uh, out of uh, uh, schools and had to shift in one day from face-to-face uh, -face learning to remote learning. We thought that there were three uh, actions that we had to take. One was uh, acting to leave no one behind. Second was uh, acting in a partnership with a wider uh, member of, of uh, uh, coalition that can mobilize the resources, be it technical, be it financial, be it uh, expertise. And we have the pleasure and, and the honor to have with us today um, uh, some of the key members of this coalition. And third, uh, that uh, we have to take actions that can uh, rem uh, offer learning opportunities particularly for the most marginalized, because we, we knew from the experience that the challenges are, are uh, to reach out to the most disadvantaged, which were already in, in a learning crisis even before the COVID. So the coalition objectives uh, are uh, covering four areas. And if I can move to the next slide, please. One is uh, to respond to the educational disruption caused by school closures. Second is to uh, scale up uh, remote learning, distance learning opportunities, be it high tech, low tech or no tech solution that uh, will be uh, and have to be implemented. We knew that uh, we had also to manage the recovery and, and the return to school and return to learning. We see that it is uh, more hybrid learning opportunities rather than uh, in, in many cases a face-to-face. -face. And today, uh, even today we know, and, and my colleague will refer to that, that uh, we have uh, around uh, half billion learners who will have to continue learning remotely. So the, the challenges are not behind us and they are still ahead. And, and the last objective that we set for the coalition was uh, uh, it's important to not only do action, but also um, advocate, make visible 
collect uh, data and information, make it more evidence-based and, and uh, mobilize knowledge from uh, the different uh, coalition members and engage in knowledge building and knowledge sharing and, and going beyond uh, the crisis and the emergency to build resilience and reimagine the future of education. And that's what we also hope the coalition will be able to, to offer. In doing so, we have, uh, next please, we have uh, mobilized uh, a wide range of, of partners um, and uh, they are in, in the next slide, if my colleagues would like to, to move to the next slide. Um, and uh, we have now more than 160 uh, partners that are uh, mobilized. Uh, they are uh, UN agencies, but also civil society and, and many uh, organizations, non-governmental organizations, philanthropy, but also private sector uh, organizations that are involved in, in, in the coalition. And we have also academia and media who uh, are contributing to, to the coalition uh, work. Last, uh, in the coalition, we have a different strand of work. We have uh, a strand which is uh, related to country work and we are working in around 70 countries all over the world. Of course, uh, this is a global initiative, so it's covering all member states, but there are priorities. And uh, as part of the priorities, of course, um, working in least developed economies and countries, working with countries who are at the uh, highest need. But we are also uh, having flagships and three of them I would like to mention one on uh, supporting connectivity. The second is about teachers' capacities and engaging uh, in uh, teacher uh, skills development, be it ICT in education, pedagogies. And the last is about gender. And we know that one of the challenges is how to reach out to the most marginalized. Uh, in some cases, it's really about uh, women and, and, and girls, but in some cases, it can be also boys. And, and part of the discussion that we'll be having today is to reach out to, the, uh, to this uh, target group. The last uh, pillar of our work in the coalition is about uh, advocacy, data collection, and uh, knowledge building. And we have, for example, we are conducting survey with the UNICEF, uh, World Bank. Uh, we are conducting survey with ILO, uh, OECD. We are conducting survey with um, IEA. Uh, we have developed uh, a toolkit with, uh, with McKinsey. We have developed a reopening framework with the UNICEF, WFP, and, and the, the World Bank. The Tisha Task Force has developed uh, other toolkits. So we are developing resources for uh, member states, for stakeholders to respond to the crisis. Let us move to uh, a new, another uh, very important organization that is playing a, a critical role in, in, in reaching to uh, the most marginalized and offering uh, learning opportunities, uh, that's Khan Academy. And uh, we are moving from Latin America to um, Europe, Asia. Uh, it depends uh, uh, where Alp uh, uh, Coxal is, but uh, we are pleased to have uh, Alp with us. Uh, uh, he's uh, leading, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the work of Khan Academy in, uh, in Turkey. And uh, we would like Alp to hear from you, uh, the Khan Academy experience, but of course, uh, with the um, with Turkish flavor and uh, having uh, also the experience that uh, you are having uh, in Turkey. Please, Al. Thank you and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I think this slide gives us a pretty good idea about what we aim at Khan Academy. Also, it's probably what the global education system aims at too. We believe in a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Khan Academy started with Sal Khan tutoring his cousin from a walk-in closet in 2006. It was earlier times for technology. YouTube was pretty new to our world, so it's a totally different setting. Sal believed that education was facing a great disruption, the digital transformation. A critical juncture after the traditional education model fought its way against change, at a time when our world was rapidly transforming. While information and communication technologies changed drastically, not much has changed in classrooms up until the new millennium, don't you think? Well, with the right use of technology, we believe that today anyone can learn anything to fulfill the 
potential inside them, given the chance to learn at their own time and own pace. And moreover, we believe that this should and could be free for anyone. Khan Academy is a non-profit organization. Everything we offer is free forever, thanks to our supporters. We don't aim for profits, as many education businesses unfortunately do. We aim for social good. Because we believe that education is a fundamental human right, just like clean water or shelter. Famously, Bill Gates is known to have used Khan Academy for the education of his children, and today the same content, the same platform, the same learning experiences available in 45 languages to 190 countries actively used all around the world. So it's a dream come true for millions of learners. It's also a dream come true for people like me who believed in Khan Academy's mission long ago for a long time. I know that Sal started alone. When I joined on board, the team was around 20 people, and today it's over 200. Much more like 2,000 if we count individual content providers, language teams, and volunteers all around the world. This growth also reflected on the platform as well. For the last 10 years or so, Khan Academy does not only offer video tutorials, but interactive exercises, advanced learning analytics, real-time feedback, teacher and parent dashboards and more. It's a smart platform with a substantial investment in AI. Our goal is to offer a personalized learning experience based on data so everyone can achieve, fulfill their potential. In subjects ranging from early math to college level biology or from electrical engineering to artistry, we also offer a an app for uh, preschool education is called Khan Academy Kids, and anything Khan Academy offers is free, as I just told you. We believe in STEAM because we believe in the importance of interdisciplinary as well as a multidisciplinary approach to education in order to have a better chance at solving the complex problems of our world in the future. When the COVID crisis hit the world earlier this year, we said perhaps We've been building our platform for this without knowing such a day would come, of course. It was the time that we step up to the plate and take responsibility. Our traffic around the world doubled, even tripled in certain parts of the globe. So did our server costs. Fortunately for us, supporters and philanthropists stepped up. So it's a good example of how humanity can support each other and unite at the time of global crisis. Today, 100 million students are learning with Khan Academy for almost 100 million minutes a day. Not only in English, in the numerous of languages, Spanish, Portuguese, French, the usual suspects, but I can also give you an example from Turkey, or I should say Turkish, because education is now independent from boundaries of time and space. Anyone who speaks Turkish land can learn from our content anywhere, anytime, given that they have a smartphone, tablet, or a computer with internet access. Turkish is one of the very first localization efforts of Khan Academy, and today we offer 9,000 video lessons in Turkish. That's more than MIT OpenCourseWare, and equal to the sum of what Harvard, Princeton, and Yale offer on YouTube for free. It's available to 25 million students in Turkey, as well as over 100 million Turkish speakers around the world, and honestly, to anyone who is curious and who wants to learn. We deliver around 500,000 lessons in Turkish every day, and we reached out to 15 million people in the past eight years, changing lives. Today, information or knowledge is flowing like waterfalls. All we need to do is take a glass in our hands and drink from this waterfall whenever we need it. Also, to teach others to hold that glass and go to the waterfall as well. We need to share. Today, we consume information just like anything else too fast. The only way we can put it back or create more knowledge is by sharing. I would like to talk about a final subject about EdTech. When we think about technology in the context of education, we sometimes tend to believe that 
the days of schools are over. Students will soon learn completely online, perhaps from machines in the near future. Although I do represent an online learning platform here today, I don't think these assumptions are true at all. On the contrary, unless it's a time of crisis like COVID, assuming that the schools are safe for students and teachers, I believe that the role of human contact, socialization, interaction in the classroom cannot be replicated by any technology yet. As Salkan puts it, I would always prefer a great teacher to the greatest technology. But technology is here to help us. We must use technology, and I'm certain that the underprivileged will benefit from this technology and from us sharing with this technology the most. So why don't we build a hybrid system to use the best of both worlds, perhaps bringing together online learning resources such as Khan Academy with a great teachers and classrooms where students are encouraged to take responsibility for their own learning. Then maybe a generation of students with a mindset for lifelong learning will take over the world. Maybe we can all share and achieve equality in education for everyone. Then I believe the human potential will be endless. Thank you. Thank you, Alp. So a uh, hybrid system, uh, this is what we, we need to uh, act for. And I, I take that point. That's what we, we need to do. Try to combine both the uh, low tech, but also advanced technology, leveraging also what you refer to as a artificial intelligence, other uh, technologies that are emerging. But in particular, keeping the goal that we are having is to leave no one behind, I, I believe. Thank you very much, Alp, and we'll get back to you. Alp, there is also a very concrete question to you. Uh, we know that Khan Academy exists and has different chapters. I mean, you, you presented the, uh, the global, but also Turkey. Uh, uh, how you collaborate with the other Khan Academies in other countries, like in Pakistan, for example? Is, is there a collaboration? Do you have a community of practices where you are sharing experiences and initiatives? In a nutshell, also, I'll please. Yeah, yes, we do. The short answer to the question is we have an advocate community we call language advocates for people who work for Khan Academy in localization projects. So it depends on the setting. In some countries like Turkey, there is an office, there is a big group of people, and we work with over 500 volunteers that help us support the localization process in translations or adaptations. But in some other places, I know that uh, several people come together and say that we volunteer to do this for Khan Academy and it's it's very valuable. I mean, some have more resources, others do not, but we all share the same mission to make Khan Academy available in different languages and we have yearly conventions to where we can come together. This year it will probably be online <laughs> for the first time, but the common practice is to share our know-how with other uh, local teams, so we don't need to discover America again. Okay, <laughs> we need to discover <laughs> other places, I hope. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.